Today I wanna speak to you about blessing. Everybody say blessing. Blessing. Blessing is the way of the kingdom. Every believer, every follower of Jesus has received blessing and can expect to enjoy the blessing of God. You are blessed. Tell the person next to you, you are blessed. You are blessed. But just because you are blessed doesn't mean that life is always perfect, right? Anybody, anybody agree with that? Man, you know, I think we haven't done a great job in the church of being honest and representing this well. We've kind of built a theology that implies that God's blessing means the absence of problems in life. But how many of you know that's just not life, right? And it's certainly not the Bible. Uh, blessing does not mean that God's prosperity replaces human problems. No, blessing means God's prosperity in the midst of human problems. Blessing and favor of God is ever present. Do you see it? Are you thankful for it? Can you sense it? Do you treasure it? Do you worship Him for all of the blessings that God gives? I mean, I could list a whole lot of blessings here. The fact that we are in a pretty much COVID-free state, the fact that we can gather, my goodness, what a blessing it is. Allow that blessing to become realized and build gratitude in your heart towards God. Worship Him for the blessing. You are blessed. Today, I wanna talk to you about blessing where Jesus references and teaches us that we are blessed out of Matthew chapter five. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus stopped on the side of a mountain with a bunch of ordinary people who were facing some pretty significant problems. He sat down, he opened his heart, and he began to teach them what God would want for their life. I'm gonna do that this morning. Just take a break. Have a Kit Kat. Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. The disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is in heaven. What an amazing passage, hey? Like Jesus is teaching about blessing. There's two observations I have. Don't worry, I'm gonna get up in a minute, but I just wanna hold this posture. It's the first observation I have about Jesus' teaching on blessing here, is his posture. You know, we would quickly read the text, the fact that Jesus sat down and think, oh man, he's such a casual king. You know, he's just like sitting, chatting, talking about blessing. But no, in those days when a rabbi sat down, it was significant. It meant that they were about to impart something of great importance. Not to mention that he sat down on a mountain. If you know your Bible well, the mountain is the place where God's people met God. So Jesus' posture is not one of relaxation, it's one of revelation. Jesus is revealing the way of the kingdom. Second observation I have about this is Jesus is not just his posture, but his perspective. He was talking to a bunch of people who were facing persecution, a bunch of people who were struggling to live for God in the midst of the world that they were in. Anyone else feel like that sometimes? It's a wrestle to live for God. And Jesus reframes their wrestles, reframes their struggles, beginning every line of their situation with the word blessed. He says, you're blessed in the midst of it. So Jesus here is not imparting something about blessing. He's teaching us that blessing is in the face of problems. He's teaching us how to respond, how to shape our heart's responses of one of blessed are we. Blessed are we because of we who know God. We are blessed in the midst of our challenges. So Jesus is teaching us how to respond when life is full of situations we can't control. That word blessed that Jesus, is used, that Jesus uses is the Greek word marakios, 
which means to be the privileged recipient of God's favor. How cool, you are the privileged recipient of God's favor, how awesome. Or as the amplified version puts it, expanding on this Greek word, it says to be happy and spiritually prosperous with joy and satisfaction regardless of external conditions. Isn't that awesome? So Jesus here through this posture and through his perspective, it's teaching us and highlighting eight inner attitudes that attract the favor of God regardless of what's going on in our lives. Eight internal attitudes. Billy Graham once described these as the beautiful attitudes of Jesus. And I'm believing today as we unpack these eight attitudes that there's gonna be a shift in the room. That God's gonna dislodge some previous old thinking and he's gonna uh, help you see that you are blessed. That some of us are gonna shift from working and living for God's blessing to living from God's blessing in Jesus' name. Are you with me this morning? All right, so eight attitudes that attract God's favor. Number one, be spiritually desperate for God. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor means begging, or I love this, dependent on others. Poor, being dependent on others. Jesus is teaching us here that being dependent on God is not a lever that we pull in bad times. It's a lifestyle for all times. I find this so challenging, yeah? Like often I'm, I only get on my knees or I pray really hard when I'm going through a hard situation, but Jesus here is teaching us, blessed are the poor in spirit when we rely on God in all times. Because the condition of our heart deems reliance on God essential, not optional. Jesus is explaining the difference here between spiritual poverty and spiritual pride. Spiritual pride is to say, I've lived a good life, a moral, an upright life. But spiritual poverty is to look deep within our soul and to recognize that there's something missing, that there's someone that needs to cure our brokenness, that we can't do it in our own strength, amen? It's to embody the song, Amazing Grace, on the daily, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, who saved a wretch like me, amen? When was the last time you dropped to your knees in dependence on God? When was the last time you repented of something? This was never intended to be a one-off salvation moment, but a daily act of sanctification, of reliance of God to go, God, I cannot do this in my own strength. I need you today to step out of our pride and to step into an understanding that our heart relies on God, amen? Is anyone spiritually desperate for God here this morning? You know, for me, it's like, Lord, just don't allow my heart to become hard towards you. Don't allow me to step into spaces without understanding what it is that you're saying. Lord, take me back to a place where my spirit yearns for you. Allow me to be desperate for you, God, because apart from you, I can accomplish nothing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember your daily need for God, then you're blessed. The second attitude that attracts God's favor is to weep over your condition. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Man, I love a good cry. Anybody else out there? I'm a, I'm a feeler. Claire will often walk in with me watching Bluey with the kids and there I am with tears rolling down my face. I'm an emotional guy. I love crying at a movie. If a week hasn't gone by and I haven't cried, there's something going wrong. But Jesus is not talking about that kind of crying here. He's not talking about your personality or your emotional state towards things that matter in your life. He's talking about weeping over the broken state of your world, about weeping over the loss of something we love or someone we love. It's not wrong to weep and to mourn the loss of something we love, to weep over the state of the world. Jesus here is validating this as a response to the kingdom. He's telling us to stop acting like everything's fine, to stop squashing the pain and the suffering we might experience. That is not the way of Jesus. Jesus himself wept at the death of hearing that his friend Lazarus Lazarus had died. 
Paul in Romans 12, in Romans 12, encourages us to weep with those who weep. So weeping, crying emotionally, but also weeping on the inside. Mourning is a part of the kingdom. Jesus' promise is that that those who mourn will be comforted. God's comfort goes beyond any kind of ordinary comfort. As Joyce Meyer once said, it's almost worth having a problem in order to experience God's comfort. It's so good. (laughs) You know, sometimes I fall into the trap of escapism here and I start to claim and proclaim the promises of God in the midst of my challenges. And honestly, that's not a bad thing. It's good to proclaim the promises of God and remind yourself of the eternal outlook. But sometimes I can make these statements, these cliches, to actually push down my own emotion and to ignore it. And Jesus here is challenging that and saying, hey, come to me with your whole heart. I'm the God of the mountain and of the valley. I can be in both places at the same time. You don't need to squash what's going on inside of you. So blessed are those who mourn is God's invitation to bring our hurts, to bring our suffering to Him. As uh, the Christian writer Rob Reamer once said, we must empty out the suitcase of our soul before God. Otherwise, we'll end up with a soul full of disappointments. You're blessed when you pour out your heart to God, when you mourn with those who mourn, when you come and you pour your whole heart to Him because God is the healer of our hearts, amen? The third attitude that attracts God's favor and blessing is to be content with who you are. Be content with who you are. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. The Greek word here used in the New Testament for meek means to be gentle, to be considerate, or to be unassuming. It's showing love and kindness to others. It's the opposite of arrogance and self-seeking. Meekness is the opposite of self-seeking. It means broken but not in the sense of like a broken, shattered glass, broken like a horse, tamed, under control, strength, under control. Jesus lived this way, under control, right? He submitted not only to God, but to his parents, to the law, and to Pilate, ultimately. This concept is completely countercultural in the Jewish period. I mean, they just did not want to submit to the Romans. And I think it's just as much countercultural now, right? Like, we don't want to submit to anyone's authority. This challenge within our heart runs all the way through humanity. We resist the idea of being under the control of others, particularly those in leadership. We want to live with an each to their own paradigm. We want freedom. We want freedom. But that's just another way to say I don't want any accountability. I don't wanna be under someone's leadership or under someone's authority, but that's not the way of Jesus. He calls us to great surrender, which brings strength and divine supply. Listen to this from A.W. Tozer. The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and strong as Samson, but he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and as helpless as God has declared him to be, but paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing, but in God, everything. That is his motto. I love that. Great surrender, understanding who we are in God's kingdom brings strength and supply. In myself, nothing, but in God, everything. Can I hear an amen this morning? You're content with when you're, you're blessed when you're content with who you are. No more, no less, as it puts in the message. The fourth attitude to bring God's favor and blessing for your life is to be hungry for God. To be hungry for God. Jesus is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, the kind of thirst that Jesus is talking about here is not the hunger that comes from missing a meal or the, or, or the thirst that comes from a, a day of manual labor. No, it's the kind of thirst and hunger where everything in your life fades away and all you can think about is a drink or something to eat. 
It's when you're so desperate that you can't think of anything else. You know, this imagery of hunger and thirst is reflected in the um, passage where Jesus encounters the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John 4, where she thirsts for water. But Jesus says, hey, I know you're thirsty for water, but there's something else you're thirsty for. And I wanna give you water that will never run dry, a water that satisfies the deepest part of your soul. It says in John 4, then it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within you, giving you eternal life. What is it that you thirst for? What are you thirsty for? You know, Jesus here is asking us, what do you thirst for? It's a call to prioritize our relationship with Jesus as number one in our life. Pursuing anything else or something else for its own sake ultimately leaves you empty. But the blessing of a hunger for God and His righteousness will leave you feeling filled. We receive water that never runs dry when we hunger and thirst for God. I believe that God is calling the church across Australia to a deeper hunger for Him. Gone are the days of hypocrisy, says the Lord. If you love me, seek me. It's not your programs, it's not your ministry paradigms that will bring growth of new people into the house. It's your purity of heart and it's your personal devotion to me. Come on, that is the word I believe God is saying to the church across Australia. Come on, you need to seek me, you need to hunger for me. Your purity of heart and your personal devotion for me will lead to your wildest dreams here in this nation. When was the last time you spent time with God and not in church? When was the last time you worshiped in the middle of the night till the wee hours of the morning until your voice broke and you couldn't sing any longer? When was the last time you prayed for that friend to come to know Jesus and prayed without ceasing, never stopping? When was the last time you sat in the Word of God and feasted, as the Bible says, on the Word? You're blessed when you're hungry for the things of God. Fifth attitude that attracts God's blessing and favor is to receive forgiveness and to be merciful. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is a call from Jesus that we should not give people what they deserve, but give them what they don't deserve. Think about that for a minute. Give people what they don't deserve. You know, there are lots of moments in life where we feel they deserve it. They started it. They don't know what's coming, just you wait. My wife hears that from me all the time. Jesus is calling us here to extend the same forgiveness and the mercy that we have received from Him. As C.S. Lewis puts it, to be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. Wow. I wonder, when was the last time you forgave someone who wronged you? Didn't just block them on Facebook or whatever. You know, you didn't just remove the problem from your existence so you don't need to think about it anymore, but you actually forgave them. When was the last time you extended mercy to someone who offended you? I urge you to look deep within here. Often for me, I love to have a good chat to my wife or my close friends about what that person did and what that situation is and how dare they do that. And then publicly, ah, hello, nice to see you. And that's not mercy or forgiveness at all. It's a mask of mercy, it's fake, it's not real. And so I just wanna urge you to look deep within your heart and present real mercy, real forgiveness to people. Because when we live this way, we allow others to see God, it says. Others see God when we extend forgiveness and give mercy. Listen, there's no room for duplicity duplicity, for double-mindedness in being a minister of mercy on the world. God is calling His church to be people of mercy. Let's be prospectors, miners of gold in other people, not fault finders. 
Man, anyone can find faults, but it takes kingdom people to find the gold, to draw out the gold. Jesus did it with the prostitute, with the tax collector, with Zacchaeus. He found the gold in people and, and showed the world of the gold. Come on, let's believe the best about other people, not believe the worst. Let's believe the best about our bosses. Let's believe the best about our spouses, about our family. Let's believe the best about our leaders, our politicians. Let's mine for gold, not be fault finders, amen? Blessed to the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The sixth attitude is to be completely sincere. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, your heart put right, says Jesus. You know, our world is absolutely obsessed with image management. You know, like we're constantly curating what we put on our social feed so that others think we're awesome. Well, I think God is saying enough with the image image mag... Enough with the image mag, oh, I can't even say it this morning. Gosh, help me. Enough with the image ma- oh. What am I trying to say? Enough with the management. I've called you to integrity. Thank you. Whew, we got it. Oh, man, maybe I was trying to manage my own image there. I don't know what was going on. Far out. Jesus is calling us to be the same person on the platform as off the platform. The same person at our workplace as we are at our home. The same person inside the home as outside the home with friends. Jesus is calling us to stop managing our image and to be people of integrity, to be people that are true. You know, like a personal story for me is when I first started worship leading, people would always come up to me and seem to like wanna give me a compliment, but they'd say something like, you're kinda like a mix between Chris Tomlin and Joel Houston. And like, I love that, I get what people are doing. They're trying to put a sense of like where I am in the spectrum of worship leading and whatever, but I don't wanna be Joel Houston or Chris Tomlin. I wanna be Zach Gagler. I don't wanna be someone else. And you know, some of us are constantly just living to the fear of other people that we are constantly managing our own self image. Now I'll tell you what that is, that is just fear. It's fear of man, not fear of God. Come on, start to be who God designed you to be. There's nothing I hate more. God has given you your own unique thumbprint. So why do we think that we need to be like this person or like that person? Come on, if God's called you to paint the color blue on the canvas of life, stop trying to paint yellow. Be you, be who God's called you to be. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right when it's the same on the inside as the outside. What a profound thought that blessed are the pure in heart, says Jesus. You know, Jesus, I reckon, just wants to set us free of insecurity, of fear, of shame, of guilt, and allow us to be who we truly are before God and before others. The seventh attitude is strive to bring peace. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Nelson Mandela said, listen to this, it's so good. It takes a long time to make peace and a short time to make tension. Many, many people make tension, but few make peace. Wherever you find tension, you must make peace. I love that Jesus calls us peacemakers, not peacekeepers. I wonder if you ever thought about that. Jesus calls us peacemakers. We are called to create peace. A peacekeeper comes in and just seeks to hear everyone and resolve the tensions, but Jesus here is calling us peacemakers. It's who we are. We're called to bring peace into the room. Now, to make peace often will require a level of reconciliation with people, like we were talking about before, extending forgiveness, uh, extending mercy. Often that requires a reconciliation between conflict. And Jesus has a lot to say about that in Matthew 18. And you can go and read that a little bit later. But one principle from that passage is don't talk to somebody about the conflict you have with someone. Go and talk to that someone before you talk to somebody. Go first to the person and deal with the offense. Go and talk about the conflict. Listen, it's really hard to be a peacemaker when that anger and that hurt and that offense is gonna bleed on other people that didn't cut you. Come on, we, don't, we can't be peacemakers if we're gonna vomit on people who never made us sick. You gotta deal with the offense inside your own heart. And maybe right now the Holy Spirit is challenging you that you need to deal with something inside of your heart. 
Maybe there's some offense what that person said or what that person did. Come on, it's time to get that right so you can step into the ministry to be a peacemaker in the world. Jesus says in the message, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete and fight. Paul tells us in Colossians that Jesus came to make peace for us on the cross and that Jesus calls us to the same ministry in the world. So we are peacemakers, not peace keepers. I wonder what kind of vibe and atmosphere do you bring when you walk into the room? Do you bring anxiety and chaos and unsettledness or do you bring calm and peace and joy and love? It's what God has called us to be, to bring peace into the room, to be a person of peace. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. In other words, peace is what we do, not peace is who we are, not what we do. The eighth and final attitude I wanna share with you that attracts God's favor and blessing is to expect nothing in return and to not be surprised by criticism. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You know, righteousness, right standing with God, right living with God, sums up all of the previous seven Beatitudes. We might think that pursuing righteousness in God's eyes would equal peak popularity, like we're gonna be fame, people of fame and fortune, but often this is not true. I mean, look at Jesus, it resulted in him in being crucified. <laughs> if you wanna know God's purpose for your life, and you wanna follow God's purpose for your life, to live these eight beautiful attitudes of Jesus. You're gonna have to be prepared to accept criticism along the way. You're gonna have to be prepared that in this world you will have trouble, says Jesus. Not might, not maybe, not could, you will have trouble. But take heart, says Jesus, I have overcome the world. So when we live out these attitudes, yes, it attracts criticism, but Jesus always promises to be with his criticized, persecuted church. He promises to be with them always. And so you can take heart and take comfort that as we live this way, as we bring God's blessing into our lives by living the way that he's called us to, that he is always with us regardless of what others say. Blessed for theirs is the, is the kingdom of heaven, he says. So Jesus told this group of ordinary people on the mountainside that day that if they lived this way, they would change their inner world and they would transform the world around them. And the same call is to us today. You're blessed when you're desperate for God, when you weep over your condition, when you're content with who you are, when you hunger for God, when you receive forgiveness and give mercy when you're completely sincere, when you're a peacemaker, you're blessed when you pursue righteousness in the face of criticism. Wanna live a blessed life? Well, let's embody these attitudes and trust me, you will experience beauty in the midst of ashes. You'll find joy in the midst of mourning and you'll know grace and peace and strength of God always because you are blessed. Can you say amen? Amen, let me pray for you this morning. Father, just thank you that we are blessed. Help us to live this out. Help us to apply these things to our lives. Right now, I pray for anyone who's harboring um, you know, an offense or a hurt. Lord, I just pray for forgiveness and mercy to flow like the water out of a waterfall. Father, I pray that it would flow freely in the name of Jesus. Father, help us to live this way. Help us to live blessed. Help us to embody these attitudes in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, well like Claire and Hugo said earlier, um, I wanna invite Tanya to the stage because when I was reading this passage, um, you know, how many of you know it's much easier to talk about things of God than to apply it, right? Like that's where the rubber meets the road. And uh, as I was reading the Beatitudes, I just couldn't get Tanya off my mind. I mean, what a year she's had. Like it didn't work out the way that I think she would have thought. And so I just wanted to have a chat with Tanya about um, about that and uh, about what it means to live a blessed life in the midst of suffering. So Tanya, what a year you've had. Wow. I don't even know how to fill that space in. It has been an absolutely massive, massive year, yeah. Mm. So we were talking about, obviously, we were talking about the Beatitudes and living a blessed life. Um, but for you, how do you make sense of all of the challenges and I guess the suffering you've been through this year, how do you make sense of blessing in the midst of that suffering for your own life with everything that's happened for you and Neil and for you here at the church? Yeah. Um, 
how do I make sense of it? It's, um, it's lovely to hear from so many of you and to hear from the staff that you have seen peace in my life, that you've seen gentleness, that you've seen courage and strength. And it's um, lovely to receive that feedback. And in fact, it's a relief <laughs> because at this stage of life and having followed Jesus for so long, um, to see that coming out of my life as a supernatural reflection of this is who I have become in Christ, that perhaps Christ is being formed in me and you're seeing that, that is such a relief and an encouragement. I've been thinking about what it means to uh, be an older person in the church and what, what kind of an example am I setting for the believers as Paul talks about. You know, how, how is Christ being formed in me and is this coming out naturally in a supernatural way? Because what you're seeing is, was not me. You know, even... I think five or 10 years ago, I was not a peaceful person in the way that I experienced peace. And so if you're seeing peace, then that's, that's miraculous. Praise God for that. If you're seeing gentleness, I was not always a gentle person, but it's, if it's coming out now, then, then praise God for that. That's, that's evidence of this transformed life. I was thinking about the Beatitudes this week as Zach was finishing his preparation. I thought, what a gift to think about these Beatitudes again because I think as a younger person, I used to read the Beatitudes as single lines and, and sort of think, I wanna be like that. I wanna be that kind of person. But actually, as I thought about the Beatitudes this week, I thought I read them as segments, but now I see it as a whole picture. This is the life that Jesus is calling us into and finally I'm, I'm understanding the whole part of life. Um, Richard Rohr is a Franciscan um, priest and a spiritual director and, and he says something quite helpful I, th I think. He says the, the 10 commandments are how we live we wanna, when we want to create good order in the world. But in the Beatitudes, Jesus calls us to take the disordered things in the world and bring them into his presence where they are transformed into blessing. So when I think about Neil's tumour then the brain stem, we bring this disorder into the presence of Christ and he transforms that into blessing. That is supernatural because it doesn't make sense. The peace we're experiencing does not make sense outside of Christ. The joy that we, and the gratitude that is flowing does not make sense outside of Christ because we're bringing all of this disorder into him and he's transforming that through our lives. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. It's amazing. Do you have any, um, how, like how do you do that? Oh, like for you, day to day, Monday through Sunday, uh, it, how, yeah, how are you doing that practically? So I think for the longest time I've wanted to, I've thought about this, um, I don't know, when you read the Beatitudes, I wonder will you picture yourself? So when I was younger, I used to picture myself as a child on the mountain looking at Jesus, talking about, talk, you know, preaching this message. And I, and I used to think, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be near Jesus. There was something about his face on the mountain as he was delivering this message that attracted people. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna be like Jesus, I wanna see his face. Probably in the last two or three years when I've thought about the Beatitudes, I've asked myself the question, where am I sitting? And in the last few years, and in particularly in the last few months, I am sitting with my heart leaning into the heart of Jesus, listening to his heartbeat. So how, how is this happening? Because I want my face to reflect the face of Jesus. I want people to see Christ formed in me, flowing out, free of hypocrisy and all those things that Zach just preached about, you know, just to reflect the face of Jesus. There was something very attractive about his face and I hope my face reflects that as well. Love that. Um, what would you say, how can you encourage us as a church, you know, how do we make sense of, you know, this year, I think, as Riverview Church, probably hasn't um, turned out how we all would expect. 
um, you know, and there's been some challenges along the way. How do we make sense of God's blessing in the midst of um, those challenges for us as a church community? I think in a similar way, we, one of the things, one of the pictures I've had over our church over the past two years is like a body that's being laid out on an operating table. It's a bit graphic. And the chest cavity is open and, and God is performing heart surgery. And I think that's an invitation for Riverview. I actually think, as Zach has said this morning, I think it's an invitation for the Australian church. God is doing heart surgery on us. And it's hard sometimes. And, and it is painful. And there are times where we wanna close it up and just let's get on with something else now because we've had enough. And I don't think God has yet finished with this opportunity that he's offering us to do heart surgery. And it's on all of us as his followers to submit to his loving, gentle, wonderful, transforming work. Because to resist this work of God is to choose to live kind of fractured, I think. But to submit to the loving hand of God is to become a whole person. That's the picture of the blessed life. We become a whole people. Whole, healthy people make a whole, healthy church to express the whole healthy gospel. And I think that, so we can, we can um, you know, God disciplines those he loves. So we can resist the loving work of God or we can go, wow, that God would love me so much that he would be at work transforming us to this extent. That's an absolute privilege, don't you think? I think it's an absolute privilege. And that's what gives me great hope for our church because I think God has put us through this heart surgery and as we all respond, so his gospel will be more perfectly declared through us as Riverview Church and that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. And that's a wonderful thing to celebrate as we see this happening in each other because I'm seeing it through the life of all of you in our church. These are our stories of God transforming us to show us what it means to be the blessed people in the way that we live. Amen. Well, would you pray for us this morning, Tanya? I will. Well, I'd love you to stand with me because I have a two-lined prayer for you. It's just two very simple lines and then the team are gonna lead us in a song of praise as we go out today. And I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine that you are sitting on that mountain as Jesus is bringing this message of the Beatitudes, the blessed life. And as you look into the face of Jesus, Here is my prayer for you, a prayer of blessing. And you may like to put your hand out to receive a blessing. May you recognize yourself in the face of Jesus. May you recognize your true self in the face of Jesus. And may Jesus be recognized through you as you face the world. Let me say that blessing again. May you recognise your true self in the face of Jesus and may Jesus be recognised through you as you face the world. Amen.